On one side there is this spacious, safe, affordable and still not bad looking car which can be equipped with the proper Quattro 4 wheel drive system. But on the other side there is this car which can leave you stranded far away from home and the car with some weak points which can lead to a significant engine or electronics damage. This can sound inconvenient, but with preventive maintenance and with a little bit of luck, it's absolutely not hard to reach 400,000 km or more with these cars. So I hope you are sitting comfortably, let's just begin with this. The Audi A6 C6 was available as a usual saloon, as a usual Avant Estate, as a less usual A6 R Road and as an absolutely not usual long version made exclusively for China. This long version has a visibly extended length and a clearly increased rear seat legroom. Of course, there is also the S6 and the RS6, but let's just focus on the regular models since I don't want to do an hour long documentary here. The interior of this A6 is still a nice place to be even after all those years. The dashboard is ergonomically inclined to the driver and all the switches are where they should be. However, there are more than enough physical buttons on the center console, which can be confusing. On the other side, most of them is related to the MMI system and after you get used to this layout, then you won't have any issues with legs or freezing, since the multimedia system still works relatively fast even at this day and age. Except the navigation system, which is obviously a bit slower. But the facelifted cars made from 2008 got a bit faster updated MMI system with improved graphics. Moving on to the materials quality, everything in the interior is most of the time in a great condition without noticeable wear even after traveling to the moon and back. However, there are some parts which can be worn out more often, specifically the windows control switch, the MMI center button surface or the keyless feature start stop buttons. And there is an interesting common problem with cracked driver's side door panel, which can often crack in this specific area. The build quality of the interior really is on a very high level. Almost everything feels really solid, but of course nothing is perfect, so cars equipped with the stiff factory sport suspension can make rattles from the dashboard on bad quality roads. And the front center armrest can make creaking noises in hot weather. The standard equipment contains basically nothing, including this standard monochromatic multimedia system display from the previous century. The optional equipment on the other hand contains various features including soft closed doors, double glazed windows, solar sunroof which will turn on the blower motor if the sun is shining, leather seats with leather dash, ambient lightning package, parking camera and all that other stuff. Although there are also some things which you can't have in this car, but you can find more additional information about the interior on my website. As always, before buying you should definitely check closely the body of the car. So except the usual mismatched paint or inconsistent gaps between the body panels, pay attention also to all the visible screws on the front fenders and on the door hinges. All of them have to be intact. If you can see that the paint around the screws is damaged like this, then someone removed these body parts in the past, maybe because of an accident. The rust protection of this A6 is mostly above average, until the car is regularly used on winter salty roads and until you know where to look at, since there are a couple of weak spots. Specifically the lower part of the doors can start to rust pretty easily, but you usually won't see this until the rust spreads pretty badly, because this lower part is hidden behind these door trims. The next hidden place is the lower part of the front fenders next to the front doors. If you remove the front wheel well liner, then you will most probably see a big amount of dirt in this area. And you should definitely clean it, because if you let the dirt there, then over time this area starts to rust. Who would imagine? But if you want to continue to play this game of rust which you can't see, then check also the place behind the rear wheels, specifically right behind the rear wheel well covers. Here you can in a lot of cases find rust as well, and again, if you don't know about this place, then you will never check it. 
The last place which is more prone to rust is the tailgate of the Avant version. So check properly mainly the edges of the tailgate and it's also good to put some wax inside the tailgate since it usually starts to rust from the inside. Luckily, at least the front hood and the front fenders are made from aluminium, so there will be no rust on these panels. I think that's all for the body, let's finally move on to the possible problems. The usual stuff like the door locks, the window regulators or the keyless entry door handles can of course break, so first thing first, check these basic features. Then it's good to check the main front door speakers which can rattle. Turn up the volume and listen for a speaker rattle, easy. This is caused by the plastic speaker dust cap, which gets loose since the glue under it gets weak over time. In this case you can remove the dust cap and re-glue it back, or you can buy a new speaker, whatever you want. After this, there is the electronic steering lock which can fail and which can leave you stranded, since you won't be able to start the car. The faulty steering lock can be completely replaced by the dealer, it can be repaired or it can be even deactivated if you find the right person. But I did a separate video about this issue, so you can find out more there. Then there is the seatbelt warning. This beautiful sound can keep brightening up your day even if your seatbelt is fastened. This is caused by the faulty buckle which you will need to replace. On the other side you can also find someone with a diagnostic computer to deactivate this warning completely. It's also good to check the two zone air conditioning properly, because if one side is cooler than the other, while the temperature is set to the same value on both sides, then this issue will be most probably caused by the heater valve, which can clog and get stuck. In some cases, it's enough to disassemble and clean it, but if this won't help, then you will need to replace it. Plus, check also the electronic parking brake, which can occasionally seize up, mainly if the previous owner not used it regularly, so at least engage and disengage it a couple of times. If you think that that's all for this car, then you are wrong, since the Avant versions can have even more additional issues as a bonus. Specifically, the rear windscreen wiper motor can fail because of the washer fluid which will leak right into the motor. But the washer fluid won't leak only into the motor, but also into the tailgate. So if nobody is going to fix this, then the tailgate slowly starts to rust because of the accumulated washer fluid. Interestingly, the washer fluid can leak not only from the rear washer motor, but also from the hose which is right next to the left trunk lid hinge. This is a more serious issue, since the fluid will leak right into the amplifier, into the radio module and into the navigation system DVD module. However, the only good thing is that this is a well documented issue, which was mostly fixed by the dealer. And the last washer fluid leak can occur right under the driver's seat. Under the carpet there is a plastic washer fluid hose, which can leak. This leak is also not the best, since you won't even know about it until the carpet will be soaked with the fluid or until your Bluetooth hands-free feature won't work properly, since the Bluetooth module and also a wiring loom are next to this hose. But as you can see on this picture, the leak can be easily fixed using a little bit of imagination and improvisation. Of course, the washer fluid leaks are pretty inconvenient, but the regular water leaks into the interior are not very helpful either. So first of all, make sure that the area under the windscreen is clean. It's very easy to check this. All you have to do is to remove the rubber seal and remove the plastic scuttle cover. After this you get access to this scuttle area and you will also see the first drain hole. Usually there is a rubber insert plugged in this hole, which will get full of dirt over time and it will be clogged up. This is not the end of the world, because there is another drain hole on the other side, which you can't see from this view. However, the problem starts when both of these drains clog, because then the water will accumulate in this area and it will slowly leak into the interior through the interior air intake. So keep this area clean as much as possible. 
The next leak is caused by the clogged sunroof water drains. There are four of them in total, but the rear drains are usually never clogged. On the other side, the front drains can be easily clogged, and in this case the water will leak onto the front side of the headliner and right down the A-pillar into the footwell area. As an example, this nice water mark on the headliner is a clear sign of a clogged sunroof water drain. So all in all, just clean occasionally these drains as well. Let's continue with the suspension which can be good, but it can also ruin your day. There are three types of suspension in these cars. The standard suspension, the S-Line sport suspension and the adaptive air suspension. As in most of the other cars, there are no extraordinary issues with the shock absorbers of the standard or the sport suspension. Just check them for leaks, of course. Also keep in mind that the sport suspension is very stiff, so if you have bad quality roads around you, then it's better to choose a car without this suspension type. The self-leveling adaptive air suspension is on the other side a different story. With this feature you can adjust not only the ride height, but also the stiffness of the shocks. So in comfort mode the suspension is comfortable, but in dynamic mode it gets noticeably stiffer and lower. Plus in the all-road version you can adjust the ride height even a little higher than in the regular models equipped with this feature. The lifetime of the front air struts is approximately 10 years, which means that after this point you are on borrowed time, since they can fail at any time. So don't be that person who has a 10 plus years old A6 with an air suspension and who doesn't have a clue that the air struts can leak at any time. Since there are plenty of stories how these owners are on a holiday and one day they will see this on a parking lot. A lowrider A6 which has a leak in one of the front air struts which means that you can't drive it anywhere except on a tow truck. A brand new genuine front air strut costs a bit more than 1600 euros, which is a lot, but it will withstand another 10 years. Of course, you can also buy a well-known aftermarket part, but buying a no-name aftermarket or a Chinese air strut is definitely a bad idea. While the front air struts are a single unit, so the shock absorber and the airbag are combined, then in the rear they are separated, which means that the air strut is a single unit as well as the electronic shock absorber. The rear air struts usually won't last that long as the air struts in the front, which means that they can start to leak even earlier than 10 years. But they are at least not that expensive. On the other side, the rear electronic shocks are really overpriced. Plus, after 200,000 kilometers or even before this mileage point, they will leak. Unfortunately, currently there is no well-known aftermarket company which would make these rear shocks for this A6. On the other side, there are companies which are selling cheaper refurbished rear shocks and there are also those Chinese-made shocks available, of course. Also keep in mind that the height sensors can seize up over time, so after buying it's good to clean and re-grease them. The other suspension components can easily withstand more than 200,000 km. Only the front upper control arms and the front drop links can be worn earlier. But of course, check all the suspension components visually and listen for weird sounds. From the petrol engines, the most reliable is the 2.4 liter naturally aspirated V6 unit. It doesn't have direct injection and it doesn't have a turbocharger either, so it is simple and reliable. On the other side, it's definitely not powerful, although for a regular, casual, calm cruising, it will be okay. Then there is the older 4.2 liter V8, again, not equipped with the direct injection. In this case it is definitely powerful enough and also pretty reliable, but it's also much more prone to different oil leaks. So definitely have some extra money left, since these leaks are sometimes not the cheapest to repair. All the other engines are equipped with direct injection, so you can expect the well-known carbon buildup or occasionally the injectors can fail as well. 
The 2 liter 4 cylinder TFSI is actually not a bad engine and with regular maintenance it can easily reach 300,000 km. But of course, the abused examples will have problems with the turbocharger or with excessive oil consumption. In higher mileage cars it's also good to check the camshaft follower which is connected to the high pressure fuel pump. This part is cheap, but it can be worn out and cause damage to the camshaft, fuel pump or it can send metal particles into the cylinder head. Also there is the high pressure fuel pump, which can leak from the solenoid valve as it's getting older. Then there is the 2.8 liter FSI and the 3 liter TFSI. These newer engines don't have any extraordinary issues except the already mentioned direct injection related problems. Of course, as they age, they can also leak, but that's nothing extraordinary. The 3.2 liter V6 again doesn't have any huge issues except the direct injection related stuff and the various oil leaks. For example, the valve cover gaskets, the oil filter housing or the rear timing chain covers can leak. You can fix these leaks without removing the engine, although it's definitely not always easy and in some cases you have to disassemble a lot of things to fix them. Plus there is the high pressure fuel pump which can leak from the solenoid valve as it's getting older. Lastly, there is the newer 4.2 liter V8 FSI. It definitely has great sound and great power. But it's also affected with the well-known direct injection flaws and it will in a lot of cases leak oil and coolant as well, like the already mentioned older V8. So because of the lack of space, some of the leaks are more expensive to fix. Plus this engine has two high pressure fuel pumps, which can again leak from the solenoid valve. Apart from all these things, it also has a more complex intake manifold with two actuator motors which can develop issues in high mileage cars. Lastly, all the petrol engines can have a faulty camshaft adjustment solenoids and these parts have been actually revised several times. Long story short, if you are buying a petrol engine, then make sure that you start the car when it's cold and check for shaking, uneven idle or for a short rattling noise. All the petrol engines have to run smoothly on idle without misfires. Check for leaks before buying and don't forget to check also the coolant. It has to be light red and clean, without any kind of oil traces or oil smell. The diesel engines don't have unexpected major issues except the 2 liter TDI 4 cylinder. This smallest engine with the older PD injection system can have problems with the Verne oil pump drive which can fail. In this case the engine will lose oil pressure and this will most probably kill the turbocharger and it can of course do other more serious damage too. But you can at least check the condition of this part after you remove the oil pan. Even the newer 2 liter units with the common rail injection can have this issue, but not that often as the older versions. So all in all, I would just stay away from at least the older generation 2 liter TDI engines, because they can have not only worn oil pump drive, but other not good specific issues as well. Then there is the 2.7 liter and the 3 liter TDI. Both of these engines are technically speaking basically the same, so they can have the same issues as well. First, there are those intake manifold flaps which can sometimes fail. In this case you get only a check engine light, so the car will drive fine. The flaps can be stuck, loose or the actuator motors can be faulty. Then it's also good to check and eventually replace the crankshaft pulley vibration damper mainly in cars which were used on winter salty roads. Since over time the inner part of the pulley will rust out and separate from the outer part. In this case the accessory belt will jump off, so this will obviously leave you stranded. And finally, the last two things related to these six cylinder engines. The high pressure fuel pump has a separate belt and a tensioner. Most of the owners don't even know that there is a separate belt for the high pressure fuel pump. So it's good to replace these two parts preventively. 
Lastly, if you are buying a car which has around 300,000 kilometers, then be prepared to replace the alternator, since its lifetime is approximately the already mentioned 300,000 kilometers. But let's talk about some positive things, like the injectors which are actually not that positive either. So the injectors can be faulty on all the diesel engines, but usually just after 200,000 kilometers. Of course, they can last way over 300,000 kilometers as well, but this depends on many different things. All you need to know is that if you got faulty injectors, then you can most of the time notice a couple of signs like the occasional light gray smoke from the exhaust while acceleration or at idle, issues with starting the engine or also a slightly bouncing idle when the engine is warmed up. Also, the newest diesel engines made from 2008 are equipped with the infamous CP4 high pressure fuel pump, which can fail and it will throw small metal particles in the whole fuel system, including the fuel tank and injectors, which roughly translates to expensive repairs. There are already numerous cases of this failure, but I'm not going deeper into this because time is money, so visit my website for more information about this. The four cylinder engines are equipped with timing belt, so just make sure that it was replaced in time. On the other side, the other engines are equipped with timing chains. The tensioners and the plastic guides can be worn, plus the chain can be stretched, but again just after 200,000 kilometers. Now, in this case you get the well-known short rattle at cold start. And actually, the petrol engines are more prone to this chain mechanism failure in which the chain mostly skips a tooth, making the engine run like garbage. But you can also end up with a more serious engine damage. This depends on your luck. The timing chains are located on the back side of the engine, so this is not the cheapest repair since you have to remove the whole engine to change the whole mechanism. Although if you got one of the six cylinder engines, and if you have around 200,000 kilometers or less and you hear the rattle, then you can first replace only the upper chain tensioners, which will solve the rattling. And these upper tensioners can be actually replaced without removing the engine. Let's move on to the gearboxes. This A6 can be equipped with the 6-speed manual gearbox or there are two types of automatic transmissions. The 6-speed manual is reliable, however check the clutch properly before buying. It should operate smoothly without any kind of strange noises, vibrations or shuddering. Plus, if you are buying a diesel engine with the manual gearbox, then it's good to have extra money left for the dual mass flywheel, which can be worn. From the automatic transmissions, the regular 6-speed Tiptronic is the most reliable, although after 250,000 km you should be prepared to replace the torque converter since it can be more worn, mainly if the previous owner never changed the gearbox fluid. Plus of course, check the gearbox properly before buying and change that gearbox fluid regularly. The Multitronic is a CVT gearbox which is still not very reliable, although it's at least more reliable than in the previous generation of this A6. Long story short, with regular oil changes and with a regular, not aggressive driving style, it can withstand even more than 200,000 km. But of course, after this mileage point, the lifetime of the gearbox starts to be very questionable. Without regular oil changes and with more dynamic driving, it can fail after 150,000 km or even before this mileage point. But if you really want the Multitronic gearbox, then at least check it properly before buying. If it's shuddering or if it's not working completely smoothly, then run away and find another car. The Quattro is still that good old school mechanical and very reliable four wheel drive system, so it doesn't have issues even in high mileage cars. Although it's of course good to occasionally at least change the oil in the front and rear differentials. To summarize things up, if you want the most reliable version, then buy a saloon with the 2.4 liter petrol engine, find a good independent mechanic and keep at least 2000 euros for the possible repairs. If you are buying a car which have more than 200,000 km, or if you are buying a V8 engine, then you should keep at least 4,000 euros. 
And to top of that, if you want a car with the air suspension, then you should keep an additional 3000 euros. And if you have personal experience with this car or more information about it, then you can write it into comments. As always, thanks for watching.